uh, let me welcome everyone and uh, introduce our uh, our today's speaker, uh, Jean Tirol. Uh, Jean Tirol is currently chairman of the board of the uh, Foundation Jean Jacques Lafont at Toulouse Science Economics. He's also chairman for the executive committee uh, of the Institute for Advanced Study in, in Toulouse and scientific director of uh, IDE also in, in Toulouse. Uh, he's a professor there at the Toulouse School of Economics or Science Economics and a visiting professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology among some other uh, duties that, that he has. So I, I guess uh, almost everyone knows pretty well the work that Professor Tyrell does. So without further ado, let me uh, give him the uh, the possibility to start his talk. Just a reminder: uh, you can ask questions either using the chat window. Uh, Professor Tyrell would prefer also to see some faces uh, if possible. So you can raise your hand using the set a status icon there on the top bar uh, you can raise the hand for example as I just did it and if you see next to my name I have the hand rise and then uh, that will tell us that you would like to uh, have your microphone open in order to, to ask a question or your camera open and then you have to enable them also on the top bar either pressing the microphone or a webcam that have to be on, on, a, on a ring icon. So thank you very much all for being present here to this uh, seamless webinar series uh, that is trying to support the uh, research that we are conducting on uh, financial stability and monetary policy topics. So please uh, let me welcome uh, our today's speaker. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Alberto, and uh, hi everyone. Welcome to Toulouse. Um, I'm going to talk about a uh, paper with Emmanuel Fari. Um, I guess you have had a paper with from Emmanuel with Ivan the other day. Uh, so that's another paper on the deadly embrace, um, and it's the first time I give a webinar, so <laughs> I'm probably going to be very very bad at that. Um, I'll try. And don't hesitate to ask questions as well. So, you know, I like to have questions seminar. I realize it's a bit more difficult to do here, but if you can ask questions, I, I like that as well. Um, so let me start um, with the motivation. As you know, uh, the story of the Euro is really a story of uh, market, financial market integration. And what we have, what we have seen, um, what we have seen lately, in the last few years is a resegmentation, a renationalization of financial markets in Europe. So here's a diagram, um, and there are many sources on that, um, which shows that say, the average bank also about one sixth of their risk weighted asset in, in sovereign bonds, I should say in domestic bonds, uh, in, in sovereign bonds in general, uh, and 70% of these are issued by the country in which the bank is headquartered. So it's actually quite a lot because um, one sixth of risk assets is actually bigger than the capital of the bank. And 70% of these bonds are actually domestic bonds. Um, so people have called that in various names, uh, this phenomenon, uh, this renationalization. They've called it the doom loop, the deadly embrace. Uh, various other vi vicious circle and it's fair to say that people just don't like it uh, it's kind of uh, a problem uh, over this phenomenon and actually that has been an impetus for the banking union or I should say the single supervisory mechanism that we have we are going to have in Europe um, but that raises a lot of questions there is, there is some vague feeling among politicians, uh, decision makers, central banks, academics, that this doom loop is actually pretty bad. Um, but why? Why exactly is it bad? Um, so we have to answer a few questions. So for example, why is that that renationalization happened uh, in the last few years and not earlier? Who is, who is at stake in a sense? Is that the country itself? Is that Greece, uh, Italy, Spain, France tomorrow? 
uh, are those countries uh, uh, jeopardized or is that the foreigners? Is that Germany with, with that stake? Um, why do domestic regulators turn a blind eye? And why are foreigners worried? Uh, after all, there is a standard accountability argument. The, the accountability argument is simply that if public debt is held at home, so there is very little sovereign debt uh, abroad, um, then you are not going to default because you'll be expropriating yourself. And that's actually why, for example, Japan is not defaulting right now because 92 to 95% of the debt is held at home, so Japan will expropriate the Japanese. Um, so why, why are foreigners worried? That's one of the questions. And what kind of policy responses we should be considered? So the framework is going to be a theoretical framework, and it's a double uh, bailout, double-decker bailout model. There is a bailout by banks, by the government, and later on, we'll introduce a bailout of the government by the international community. It will be a standard liquidity model, and nothing new there. Uh, to have a liquidity prime, you need at least three dates, so we're going to take only three. So date zero, one, and two. At date zero, the banks manage their liquidity. So basically, they know they may need money at date one, and they have to hold some money. They have to hold some money, just like in my model with Bank Tomström. They, they want to hold some money because they will be create ration uh, at date one. Not all income is pledgeable to investors, so they have to uh, engage in liquidity management. And they will have a very simple choice. The choice will be between holding domestic sovereign bonds, uh, the public bonds, or foreign bonds uh, issued by you know, safe entity. So think of that as, you know, you are a Greek bank, you can all Greek bonds, or you can all German bonds. Okay. At day one, there will be a shock, which will be a macro shock, which will be observed. And it could be a fiscal shock, uh, which affects the ability of the country to repair day two. Or it could be a balance sheet shock on the banks. It could be one or the other. It's going to be the same in this model. And at that point of time, if the banks hold domestic bonds, so imagine, for example, a fiscal shock. So there are some doubts about the country, whether the country can repair day two. Uh, then um, the banks are going to have less money because the price of those bonds is go are going to decrease and they have to be bailed out by the government and we are going to make assumption that guarantee that the, the government wants to bail out ex post the, the, the banks even so ex ante doesn't want to give money to the banks and anticipating this bailout the banks at day zero will aspire to minimal diversification so they will try to load up on uh, domestic bonds because that's what's going to maximize their put on taxpayer money. So basically, um, if they have domestic bonds, those will be risky bonds. If the price of those bonds goes up, that's great because they keep the money. If the price goes down, they have a shortfall of income, they cannot continue, and then the government has to bail them out. Okay? And in order to have the maximum put on taxpayer money, they have to take a lot of risk, so they have to invest in the risky domestic bond. And here is a basic insight, which in a sense corresponds to the conventional wisdom. In case of a fiscal shock, say, again, it could be a balance sheet shock for the banks, the price of domestic sovereign bonds is going to fall. That will increase the risk you need, so the government will have to put more money in it, and that will accentuate the fiscal shock, um, which in turn is going to reduce the price of domestic bonds, which is going to create even more primes for the banks and so on and so forth. So that's a doom loop, and we are going to look at the consequences of this doom loop. There will be a regulatory game, and the banks want to minimally diversify, okay? Uh, but 
The regulator would like to prevent renationalization, so they would like the banks to diversify, at least if there is no international bailout. As we will see when there is an international bailout, that's quite different. So there will be what we call an opacity game. So the banks want to have an opaque balance sheet, and the regulator tries to force diversification. And here is going to be our first insight. There will be strategic complementarity in exposures. So if in the risky country, the other banks take on a lot of domestic debt, then you yourself in this country, you would like to take on a lot of domestic debt. Those are strategic complements. So let me explain why. The other banks on diversified portfolio, they are going to worsen the feedback loop. So they are going to basically imply the mean preserving spread. I mean, it's not exactly the concept, but it's basically mean preserving spread um, in the return on domestic debt, because that increases the feedback loop. And that's going to increase the put on taxpayer money. And therefore, that gives you incentive to invest in opaqueness. I mean, they, there will be a cost of opaqueness, uh, but you'll have more incentive to, to be opaque if the return of opaqueness, on opaqueness is higher, and the return on opaqueness is higher if uh, the banks actually, if there's a big feed, feedback loop. Okay. The second insight is a renationalization when there are bad news. Okay. So we are going to see several reasons for what the case, but that's very important because renationalization is not going to happen randomly. It's going to happen basically when you start worrying about the country, not before. Okay. So that's going to be uh, the first thing. By the way, I have a tendency to speak a little bit fast. Um, and since I don't see your face, uh, I don't know whether I'm speaking too fast. Um, so don't hesitate again to ask questions if you think I'm unclear. So later on, we are going to introduce a legacy, a legacy Laffer curve. So basically, um, what's going to happen is that in bad times, the international investors who have lent to the country anticipate bailouts. Okay, they know that the government is going to bail out the banks. And that's going to mean that sometimes you are going to be on the wrong side of the Laffer curve. And it will be in the interest of foreign investor in that case to reduce the surrender, to renegotiate surrender debt, because you are on the wrong side of the Laffer curve. But once you get this subsidy in bad times, that means that the government of the risky country is less excited about regulating its bank. Actually, it's an incentive for prudential leniency. And in turn, it's an incentive for a single supervisory mechanism. What happens is that domestic countries, each country is going to uh, basically not look at the exposures, not look at the doom loop, for its um, domestic banks, and that's going to be bad um, in terms of credibility. And later on, we'll discuss whether it's bad for Greece or if it's bad for Germany. And then after we do that, we'll go through four interesting extensions. Um, there is a huge literature on, on those topics, and probably some of you know that pretty well. So. Uh, there is a literature on feedback loop in a closed economy, so that's not very relevant. I mean, there are some, some papers by Acharya Dreschler and Schnabel and Cooper and Nikolov. Then there are papers on feedback loop in an open economy, so that's closer to what we do here. Uh, there is this paper of Bonner, Martin, Ventura, uh, which is based on a completely different mechanism. It's based on selective default. We are not going to have selective default, but the idea is, is kind of intuitive. Um, if you have selective default, then you'll default only on foreigners, but you'll do that only in bad times, just like in the standard uh, uh, international finance literature, you, you have a tendency to default in bad times. But in, that means in, in bad times, the foreigners will want to basically get rid of their bonds, and they will resell those bonds to domestic uh, agents, and therefore there will be a re renationalization in bad times. Um, there is a paper by Hulig, which is probably the closest uh, uh, 
to what we're doing here with no selective default and he also has a double decker bailout so those papers have some similarity and we have some uh, specific and uh, specific implication and so does it and then there are a bunch of other papers uh, there's still uh, there's a paper by Genaioli, Martin and Rossi where there is no bank bailouts and so on um, and then there are some older literature and of course when we touch on the Laffer curve um, there is an old literature on sovereign debt renegotiation which is very relevant there so there are lots of uh, papers actually we we use ingredients somehow of all those various papers uh, to write our stuff and if, if you have other suggestion to me of course you should feel feel free to send me an email uh, but and there are lots of I mean a lot of uh, interesting papers which are relevant for for this particular one so there are no questions yes there is a question there in the chat window by, by Martin Tobal Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, so the questions, everybody can read the question, I take it. So if the government par partially bonds are out in the of failure. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the risk premium, the risk premium on, on its domestic, I mean, on the public bond will depend very much on whether a bailout is expected. Um, but um, still, um, you, you'll see what happens. Still, the fact that you bail out the banks is going to make things even worse. So here the repayment capacity will be a repayment capacity at day two. Okay. If at day one you bail out your domestic banks, that means that you t have to take on more debt. So that means that the day two repayment is even more uncertain. So that's the mechanism that is going, that is going on. Uh, they will basically paying the cost of failure actually is going to make the bond even more risky, not less risky. Um, so that we'll, we'll go through that in more detail if, if that's okay um, in the model. I was not very, very clear in the introduction, but you'll see very quickly what's, what's going on in the model. So but please keep asking questions, that's, that's very useful. So the model has three dates, zero, one, two, and there will be some uncertainty which is resolved at date one. Uh, so the state of the world S, and there is some distribution over the state of the world, d pi of S, will be realized. And that world is going to determine the balance sheet and the fiscal capacity. Uh, there are four kinds of agents. Um, the institutional investors, and there, there is nothing interesting in the international, international investors. They just maximize the sum of their consumption, so they are risk neutral, and they're, they just demand to, to break even, so the natural rate of interest for them is equal to zero. They just want to, to get back their money. Star means foreigners, right? I mean, so foreign is indicated by a star. Then there are banking entrepreneurs, and we're going to take a continuum just to avoid uh, game theoretical effects. But um, you know, you could have a finite number; it doesn't matter. Um, and then there are domestic consumers. So domestic consumers will be very boring in this model because what they what they do is just they are just taxed, and they are taxed by the fourth player, which is the government. So basically, the domestic com consumers will get an endowment at day two. This endowment can be taxed by the government in order to repay the debt. Okay, so that's the story. So the domestic consumers, all they do is to get an endowment from zero to infinity, and there's some uh, some density or some CDF, and that's at day two, and we let this the density of this endowment on zero infinity depend on the shock S realize at date one. So you may learn something about the fiscal capacity because the fiscal capacity is going to be linked to the endowment received by consumers. Um, there will not be any distortionary taxation in this model. So basically the consumer will consume E minus the taxes. So 
the, the government needs taxes to reimburse the debt at day two, it's just going to tax the consumers. Now, it may be the case that the endowment is not sufficient. And in that case, there will be a default, and I'll come back to that. Um, the distribution of the endowment uh, gives you a quasi-concave Laffer curve. So the hazard rate, small f over 1 minus capital F, is increasing with E. Okay? And most distribution that you are aware of actually satisfies this assumption. It is not an assumption for distributions, and that gives you a quasi-concave Laffer curve, and that simplifies things. The other thing, the other convention is that if you have a higher S, uh, that's good news. So for, in particular about the consumer endowment, so derivative of F of 1 minus capital F divided by dS uh, is negative. So an example of that is when the distribution capital F of E given S, you can write it as f of e minus s. If you have f of e minus s, then um, the second condition is implied by the first. Okay. So what you have to know is that higher s is good news. Okay. And as usual, there is a debate in international finance about whether default is strategic, so you just don't want to pay, or default is due to the fact that you don't have a money for it. And, you know, it's very much the same. So think of it as being disposable income beyond some perceived incompressible level of consumption. So zero, you don't, you're not willing to go be below zero in terms of consumption, zero being your reference consumption. You, don't just, you just don't go, want to go below. And if E is, is a difference between what your consumption your minimum consumption and what you can use to repay your debt. Okay. Um, the banking entrepreneurs, um, they are like consumers, they consume at day two, two, and they invest at date one. So think about that as investment, or it could be they could have invested at date zero, and then IFS would be a liquidity shock, and you need to reinvest at date one either way. It's simpler to think about a, a, an investment at date, at date one. And we allow for balance sheet shock. So the balance sheet shock means that if S is larger, then the investment need is smaller. Conversely, if S is small, you need to invest more. So that's bad. You need more money. And then you receive entirely non-pledgeable income, row one of S times I of S at day two, and it's just a, like a pride benefit, it's non-pledgeable, so you, you cannot have any leverage when you borrow at day one, okay? Later on, we do the same thing with pledgeability and leverage. Uh, for those of you who know, who know my work with, with Bank Armstrong and, and Emmanuel Ferry, that amounts to introducing a row zero, which is pledgeable and allows you to go to the capital market at date one. But the important thing is, of course, that, that you'll be credit ration at that date. Um, so we assume row one of S is greater than one. So actually, it's a good thing uh, to, to invest. You want to invest rather than holding a German bond or a foreign bond, which is safe, which is going to return one in this model. Um, at date zero, the entrepreneur are, are born with an endowment A each. And let's assume that if they invest the entire endowment into the German bond, in the, to the foreign bond, they will have enough money to invest at date one. So regardless of the level of the shock, I of S will be smaller than A. Okay, so it will be smaller uh, than the endowment. And given the preferences for the foreigners, they want one for one, the rate of return on the foreign bonds will be zero. And so if they invest A in foreign bonds, they will have enough money to always invest at date one, which will mean that actually there is no need for a bailout. I mean, I'm anticipating a little bit, but that's the story. So there is always enough money at date one if you invest in the safe asset, 
with zero return. The problem is that you may invest in the domestic asset, the public bonds, um, and those are risky and you may end up with a bad, bad state of nature. So let's assume that at day zero, um, you invest your endowment A both in domestic bonds and in foreign bonds, B0 and B0 star. Okay. And that means your balance sheet will be more risky if you invest more in B0. Okay. The assets both have day two maturity. So that's a, that's a simplification. We are going to assume some kind of asset liability management. When the government issues government bonds, it's going to issue at day zero bonds, which have maturity at day two, meaning maturity at the date at which the government ta can tax the consumer. So you match income with the maturity of the bonds. Now, it's not a completely obvious proposition. You might, after all, uh, have a maturity at date one, and at date one, you could roll over uh, those bonds if you wanted to. That's one of the extensions we, we go through, and trust me, it, it's not a bad assumption, okay? It's actually a, a good assumption, but, but you need some condition for this to be the case. Let's assume they are they are domestic foreign sovereign bonds, B0, and later on we'll, we'll investigate a little bit where they come from, but think of that as being legacy debt, which is uh, issued at date zero. And to simplify things, we're going to assume the foreigners are marginal investors. Um, so there is a date zero price P0 and a date one price, which will depend on the state of nature P1 of S. Whereas a foreign bond, they will exchange one for one, so the world rate of interest is equal to zero. What this means is that your endowment, as a banking entrepreneur, you're going to allocate it between uh, the date, um, the, the foreign bonds, B0 star, and the domestic bonds, which will have an endogenous price, P0. Okay? Um, now, the required bailout, um, at date one will be given by the following expression. Let me try to show off and put an arrow. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the required bailout will be the difference between the investment need and the value of the portfolio of the bank at date one. So what is the value of the portfolio of the bank at date one? It's B0 star because it's a safe bond. But domestic bond now will have price P1 of S instead of P0. So in a bad state of nature, S, when S is small, the, the, the wealth of the bank will be P1 of S, B0 plus B0 star. And if it's less than I of S, then there will be a shortfall. And we'll make assumptions so that the government wants to bail out uh, this, um, this bank. Okay. Now, we are going to look at an equilibrium in which all the ba all banks do the same. Again, there are conditions for that, but let's, let's forget about that. And so in one of the bad state of nature, so when I of S is, is greater than the date one wealth of the banks, okay, um, then you have to issue more bonds. So you have to move from B0 to B1 of S, which is greater than B0. But those bonds, you will issue them at price P1 of S. So you see P1 of S is going to determine the price at which you issue the new bonds. But it's also going to determine um, the wealth, the balance sheet of, uh, of the uh, banks. So it's going to have this uh, dual purpose. And of course, it will be endogenous. And that's one of the, thing, the things we want to discuss. OK? Um, Bailout is only, only going to happen for small s, so for the bad realization of the state of nature, that there will be some kind of s tilde, some cutoff, and there will be a bailout when s is less than f, s tilde that depends on the balance sheets. Because you see that from the equation here, because the impact of s on the banks will be through P1 of s, and that will depend on B0, okay? That will depend on how much uh, 
domestic bonds the bank has. Okay. So let me move on and make some assumptions so that you want to have bailouts. And then I'll come back to the question that was raised by, I think, Martin. Um, the underlying assumption uh, on the welfare function is the following. I'm going to assume that the government maximizes uh, the, the consumption of the consumer, C2C. You can add uh, some welfare that you put on the bankers, some weight you put on the bankers' welfare. They consume C2B at day two. And beta B can be the weight that you put on, on the bankers. Now, the important assumption that this weight is less than one, because otherwise, if the weight were greater than one, that means you will prefer the bankers to the consumers. Then basically what you will do is just to give the entire wealth of the economy to the bankers anyway. Um, and that's not very interesting. So having beta B less than, than one basically may, means that you don't want to give money to the bankers. Now, why do you have bailouts? Well, you have bailouts because uh, you care about the bank's functioning. So here, and we have some foundations in the paper, here the story is that uh, the banks lend to the firms, they monitor the firms. So just like in my old paper with Armstrong in 1997, not the 98 one, but the 97 one, um, you need the banks to monitor the firms. And if the banks cannot lend, uh, the firms cannot operate. And that's the end of the story. So what, what we do there is to uh, put some weight on, on the banks investing. So let's be IFS uh, the investment uh, needed for the bank. And let's assume there is a mass of banking entrepreneurs, mu of S, which on, undertake the project, something between zero and one. And you put beta I on with beta I on investment taking place. Then you get an extra term because you, you want the credit to operate in the economy. Okay. And the trick in this kind of model is to assume that beta I is sufficiently large. So that even so you don't want to give money to the banking entrepreneurs, you're going to bail out the cashless banks, the banks which don't have enough cash. Okay. Uh, the default um, in this economy is non-strategic. Um, so basically, we assume there is some cost of default phi. Um, it's completely exogenous and completely ad hoc, I and mean, it's not very important. But uh, basically, you don't want to default if you can avoid it. So basically, you are going to default if and only if your tax capability is insufficient. So at date one, after the bailout, you will have a total debt B1 of S. And at day two, you have a re realization E of your endowment. And if E is less than B1 of S, you don't have enough money to pay back your debt, and then you default. And that basically tells you that the price, the spread, uh, the spread at date one, which is given by the difference between one, you know, the price of German bonds is one. Uh, one minus P1 of S is a kind of spread. And P1 of S will be determined by the priority that this bond will be reimbursed. So that the priority that uh, the date two endowment E be greater than B1 of S, condition on S. Okay. So that's the story. That's going to give you the pricing at date one through so a very simple equation. It's simply the priority of reimbursement. And moving back uh, to the Laffer curve, I mean, there are two, you have to pay attention, there are two, La two Laffer curves in this model. Uh, there is a Laffer curve for issuing debt at date one, and there will be a Laffer curve for the foreigners. Okay? Um, so at date one, if you, if you want to move from date level B0 to date level B1, then you have to uh, increase that you have to raise B1 minus B0. And the price at which you are going to raise this, uh, this new debt is going to be P1 of S, which is 1 minus F of B1 given S. OK? Now, for the moment, we are going to assume that at date one, the issuance is always going to 
suffice to, to pay the, for the bailout. Now, it may not be the case. It may be the case, and I'll discuss that later on, that there is no way you can issue enough debt so as to bail out your banks. Okay? It may be that, that may be the case. But let's take this simplified assumption. There will always be a bailout. Okay? So I hope it is clear. And again, don't hesitate to ask questions if you if you have um, if you have any question about about this. Okay. So just a recap of the timing. The recap of the timing um, at day zero, the banks invest um, A and they select. Oops, there's been a little bit of a prime there. I don't know what happened. Apologies about that. I hope there is no more prime in the PDF. But they select B0 and B0 star, okay, at the at day zero. Um, then the state of nature is realized at date one. That determines the fiscal prospects, so the distribution of date two income and tax capability, and also the financial needs of the of the uh, you know the investment needs of the banks, IFS. The government issues B1 of S minus B0. To finance the rescue package, and the bank, if they are bailed out, uh, actually, and they will be, invest IFS, and then the government at date at day two selectively defaults if if it doesn't have enough money, so if E is less than B one of S. Now the arbitrage equation at date zero means simply that P zero is the expected P one, okay. And that's because we are assuming that the marginal investor are the foreigners. The foreigners, they are risk neutral, they just want their money back. So the price at P0 is just the expected price at date one. Okay. Okay, so that's the story. Um, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to solve for this, uh, this economy. So a couple of results, we take a simpler example in which yeah, it's a little bit uh, I'm not that contrived, but it's less general than what we do. So we assume that in, there's no balance sheet shock, so the investment is just A. So if you invest in a safe asset at day zero, you just get in just what you need. Row one is consensus, that's not very important. In a good state of nature, there will always be a lot of uh, income in the economy. Um, and therefore, E is very large, and capital E is very large, and you always reimburse your debt, so the price P1 will be equal to 1. But in the bad state of nature, there can be three levels of income at day 2, capital E, small E, and 0. Um, and so when you have capital E at day 2, you, you reimburse. Um, when you have 0, you never reimburse. But when you have small E, well, it will depend. I mean, sometimes you'll be able to reimburse, sometimes you won't. It depends on, on B1. Um, so, you know, that's the simplest model that you can think of. And let me move on uh, to, um, I mean, I'm going back to the continuum case. And just to give you the equation for uh, the doom loop. So that's, that's a, it looks complicated, but it's really the doom loop equation, okay? The doom loop equation basically tells you how the date one price of domestic bonds vary with, vary with the state of nature. So if you look at the numerator, you just get two effects. The first effect minus DF over DS simply says that if you have bad news about your date two fiscal capacities, or if you have good news, whatever, that's going to change the price of the bond at date one. Okay, that makes it more or less likely that you'll be able to reimburse. The second term is a term in DI over DS. So basically, if the say S increases, for example, then the investment need of the bank is going to decrease. If you are in the bailout region, you have to you can reduce your bailout, and that's going to be good because you borrow less. And that means that your domestic bonds will be more valuable at date one. So that's just direct effects. They have nothing interesting. The interesting part is the denominator. And the denominator is not one. You have a multiplier effect. And let me just uh, look at the first bullet, 
which is the interesting thing, is that if you do the computations, you have a larger multiplier if, um, I mean, it's probably written, but if, if, you have, if you have a lot of domestic debt, and that's going to be very important, if you have a lot of domestic debt, then you will have a larger multiplier. That's a doom loop thing I was talking about. If, you have, if the banks hold a lot of domestic debt, then in bad times, and again, it's just for Iceland and the curve S tilde, in bad times, uh, the banks will be very poor, the bailout will be very large, and then that will have knock-on effect on P1. Okay, So that's what's going to um, actually give rise to strategy complementarities in a sense, which is that if the other banks, if the rest of the banks invest a lot in domestic bonds, then there will be a lot of uh, doom loop effects. That means that uh, the price is going to be very low in bad times. But of course, on average, it's just going to be one at date zero. So, you know, it's, I mean, basically, P0 is going to be the expectation of P1. So it's basically going to offer an opportunity for banks to take on more risk. Okay, no questions. So I continue. Um, Preferences for over diversification. So, if there is no no game, so to speak, the banks always prefer B zero star equal zero because I mean, that you can show by looking at their payoffs. But intuitively, you are going to be bailed out anyway. So, given that you are bailed out anyway, uh, you don't have the downside. You want to have the upside, and obviously, the domestic bond, which is risky, is going to have a big upside. You don't want to hold a boring German bond because it's not going to give you any upside. Whereas if you hold the domestic bond, you're going to be covered on the downside through bailouts, and you are not going to be uh, you're going to, you're going to enjoy the upside. Now, conversely, the government, and that's in the absence of a, an international bailout, will uh, prefer full diversification. So, we like the banks to put all their money in sovereign and foreign bonds, or at least the uh, high bar, which is the upper bound on, on the investment need. Okay. So here is a collective more hazard thing. I mean, this is a theme that we have developed already in, a, in another paper uh, with Emmanuel, but it's a completely different mechanism here. But it's a thing that it, it has to do with strategy complementarities. So, for example, a simple way to, to formalize things is imagine that you can make your balance sheet more opaque. So, if your balance sheet is completely transparent, um, the um, uh, I'm seeing a question of Alberto. I'm going to, to answer. Let me just finish this sentence. If your balance sheet is completely transparent, um, then the government will impose full diversification. So, the game for the bank will be to make uh, the balance sheet non-transparent and basically conceal some of the exposure uh, to the domestic bond. So let me uh, turn to Alberto's question. Um, the information set of all agents is the same, yes. So everybody has the same information set, um, except possibly for this um, uh, individual exposure at date zero. At date one, you can assume that the government observe, observe the balance sheet of the bank. That's okay. I mean, you have two versions. Either it observes or it doesn't, but everybody has done the same. It doesn't matter. So at date one, um, there is symmetric information. The only degree of asymmetric information in this model might be at date zero, and this is really what I'm describing here, which is that the bank may want to try to make its balance sheet opaque uh, so as to basically enjoy the put on taxpayer money, the government may not want to do that. Okay, does it answer your question, Alberto? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so um, think about this game in which, I mean, here you could introduce the regulator as a player as well, but just think about the convex cost. If you want to make your balance sheet more opaque, so that means you you have more B0 on your balance sheet. You have to pay a cost of that. Okay, 
maybe you have to take on uh, derivative products, CDSs, and, and things which are very complicated, and you have to pay fees for that, and you know the management may not completely understand what's going on. I don't know. I mean, it's very reduced form. Basically, you have a cost of making your balance sheet opaque. But given this reduced form assumption, which I think is reasonable, but you know it's a reduced form, so it's never totally satisfactory. Um, there is the basic mechanism for strategy complementarity is pretty clear. And other banks, uh, if other banks take on domestic sovereign debt, so they increase their B0, they reduce their B0 star, then the doom loop is going to make the debt riskier. So in bad times, the price is going to be very low. Um, and there will be more incentive to adopt an undiversified portfolio. So if, if all the other banks adopt an undiversified portfolio, Bank I also has incentive to adopt an undiversified portfolio. Now, the argument is simple. The mathematics are a little bit more complicated because when you change the distribution of P1S, which you do when you change the exposures, then you also change the debt zero price P0. Okay? Because P0 has to be the expectation of P1S, and therefore, um, you know, it's going to dampen things. Um, so if P0 is lower because of less diversified portfolios, then P if P1 of S is lower because of, le of less diversified portfolios, then P0 is also going to be lower. And the capital losses in that state are going to be smaller. So you have to check this intuition is right. And you have to trust me, um, there is no blackboard, so I cannot... <laughs> I cannot show it to you on a blackboard, so I'm safe. I won't be making mistake on a blackboard. You just have to trust me that everything is all right. Okay. Ah, there's a sketch of a proof. I forgot that I wrote a sketch of a proof. But um, imagine, for example, that A is equal to I of S for all S. Um, and basically, in that case, that simplifies things a bit because the cutoff, uh, the cut, forget about this complicated equation, but the cutoff S tilde is given by P1 of S tilde is equal to P0. That means that it's a realization where you get a return of zero on your investment. But then since A is equal to I, then you get, you get just enough to, to invest. So that's, that simplifies things a bit. And now when you invest one more euro, and usually you use dollars, but it, since it's a, Eurozone kind of uh, prime for the moment. I mean, it could be a prime for other countries as well, but uh, obviously, but for the moment, it's mainly the Eurozone uh, prime. So you invest one more euro in domestic debt. So you buy one over P0 domestic, domestic bonds. Then you have an expected gain, which is uh, what's here in yellow. Um, on the downside, it doesn't matter. As I said, you know, on the outside, if you lose money, you'll be you are bailed out anyway, so it doesn't matter. And you just get the stuff on the upside. So on the upside is when S is greater than S tilde. And you get P1 divided by P0 minus 1. So that that gain that you realize, so at S tilde you make you make zero gain by definition, but um, then you get the upside. Um, okay, and what happens is that just as a sketch of a proof, um, if you have riskier balance sheet for the bank, so B zero star prime is is smaller than B zero star, then you can check that debt is going to be more risky. So P zero prime is less than P zero. Trust me again on that thing; it's kind of intuitive. But you know, it's still going to be the case that P1 star of S is equal to P1 of S for all S greater than S tilde. Because the price is lower at debt zero, then the wealth for given S is going to be higher at debt one whenever P1 is greater than P0. And therefore, there is no bailout again for S greater than S tilde. And the you know, the expected gain is even going to be bigger than what's in the frame here, in the yellow frame here. Okay, it's a bit, it's a bit fast, but, you know, the intuition of the proof, I think, is, is kind of relatively simple. Okay, just to summarize, uh, you have strategy complements. So strategy complements means you want to do the same thing as the others. 
and you have a possibility of multiple equilibria. Yeah? And we check that's that the first place where you use a specific model, you know, either uh, I, either high realization of E or, or three possible realization of E. And you get exactly what, what you have in mind, which is here, for example, if you, call, if you look at the initial debt B0, at the start, you only have one equilibrium, which is a high diversification and low probability of default equilibrium. Um, so B0 star is high, and there is a low probability of default. But then after a while, when things go bad, so when uh, B0 is large, for example, then you have a second equilibrium, which is a low diversification, high probability of default equilibrium. And then if things get even worse, that's the only equilibrium that is left. And here we have a first mechanism for renaturalization. Basically, you get renaturalization, uh, so meaning that you get B0 star small um, when things go bad. Either you, you get a lot of uh, public debt or you get bad news about the fiscal capacity or something like that. So you get the first mechanism for renaturalization. Basically, when everything goes well, there is no point of making your balance sheet opaque uh, because you know, things will be fine anyway. You just expanded resources to make things complex, but there's very little gain. Then when the things go bad, you can enjoy the put on taxpayer money and you have very strong incentive in making your balance sheet opaque and you have a renationalization in the process. Okay. That's the first mechanism for renationalization because later on we'll see a second mechanism. But it's an interesting mechanism um, that is going on now. Okay. I don't see any questions, so um, let me continue. Um, either everyone is asleep or that's a nice thing about those seminars is that you can fall asleep and uh, uh, I would never notice. Um, but I cannot see if I'm, I'm really boring or not. So that's <laughs> okay. So let me go on. Um, debt forgiveness, um, lax regulation and banking union. So now we are going to, you know, I told you it's a double decker bailout model. So there was bailout of banks by the government. Now we can have a bailout of the government by, by the international community. So we are going to have a second Laffer curve at date one. So it's not the issuance Laffer curve, but it's going to be uh, the legacy Laffer curve. So you have those foreign investors at date zero who will have purchased domestic debt at date zero. And at date one, they are bad news. So they know that the government is about to bail out uh, the banks. And the bad news will become very bad news. So it's very unlikely that the government will repay. And you might be on, on the right side, which means the wrong side of the Laffer curve. Um, and then you might want to voluntarily reduce the debt. Um, so you might, it might be the case that at B0, for example, you might want to reduce the debt um, uh, to B0 to some B0 tilde. Um, so actually the point at which you, you want to reduce it to a B0 tilde, uh, which is lower than B0, which is going to depend on the state of nature and it's given by the equation at the bottom. Um, you have to um, you have to take into account the fact that uh, there are domestic uh, assets and there will be a bailout and the end this equation at the bottom, which I'm not going to discuss, but basically it's a Laffer curve. Uh, given the anticipation of a bailout, what is your optimal debt forgiveness? And that is given by this equation. Okay. So once you get this, you get um, a very simple conclusion, which is kind of trivial, which is that you'll get strategic regulatory leniency, okay? So even if the domestic regulator can monitor the exposures, I should have said B0, so even if there were no asymmetric information, uh, 
even if there is no, I'm sorry, I have a question, yeah. What are the incentives for government to avoid bank investment in national bonds? Um, I guess you, this question is about the previous one. So this one, um, the truth is that there is no incentive. So the bank, the government, government would like to prevent the domestic bank from taking risk because it, at date zero, it doesn't want to bail out at date one the banks. Okay. But the assumption, and I was not very clear on that, the assumption is that the banks themselves voluntarily make uh, their balance sheet opaque. So there's the pay a cost to make it invisible, to make their um, exposures invisible to, um, to the regulator. So that's this psi function, which is a reduced form. Um, and the regulators, I mean, think of that. I mean, there are things that the regulator can check. Also, it doesn't check every day, which is how many um, domestic bonds are held by the banks. But then the exposures can be very diverse. It's not only the number of domestic bonds, but you know, it could be uh, all kinds of involvement in derivative and CDS markets. It could be the way you invest in things which are correlated you know, industrial stuff, which is correlated with with the governments. Uh, so, for example, you can invest in a quasi-government agency or in a firm which is public and will or private will be bailed out by the government, and so but may not be bailed out by the government. I don't know. And there are lots of different stories about that. But the answer to your question um, um, from the Central Bank of Venezuela. Uh, the question is the answer to your question is that the, in this particular model, and, and until we have international bailout, the government will not want the bank to take risk. Is that does it answer your question? Okay, okay. So now things are going to be different if the government can enjoy debt forgiveness, because then it may want to let its bank take risk, because that's what's going to give rise to the international bailouts. So even if monetary exposure be zero star of R is costless, so that, that contradicts the previous assumption, you know, the PSI stuff, um, the country may still let its bank choose be zero star less than I bar. So may voluntarily let its bank take on risk okay so that that's what we show actually show there we use a simple example we don't have it in full generality um, and we actually show that happens only again in bad news when you have bad news and it um, i'm sorry that doesn't fit yeah no there is more leniency if the probability of, of a bad shock, one minus pi at date one, but that the date zero probability increases. So if at date zero, things look bad on the probability of a sh bad shock, uh, then there will be uh, basically regulatory leniency, and that will be a second mechanism for debt renationalization. So there, it's not the banks themselves who spend more money to be opaque and take on risk. It's the government itself which lets the banks take on risk, right? So that's really uh, the story behind it. We have a second story, and it coincides with the first in its implication because it basically says it will happen, you know, when things go bad. Okay, the renationalization, but the channel is not quite the same. Instead of being the banks. Uh, basically take on, taking on more risk voluntarily by making their balance sheet opaque is going to be the regulator himself who basically lets the banks take risk. Okay. Um, and a cheap conclusion is that it's going to give rise to a rational for the banking union, I should say not this resolution part, but the supervisory part. So you want to get regulation out of the hands of the country itself. Now, in this particular instance, 
it's actually a commitment issue. So the country itself actually would like to basically delegate to banking union. Now you may say it's strange because after all, it's getting a bailout at date one from the international community. But of course, under rational expectation, at date zero, it's going to pay for the bailout. So the price P0 will be low. You know, if people anticipate that the government is not going to regulate its bank, that's going to make uh, the country very fragile, then uh, P0 will be low and that will be very costly for the government. So there's a commitment or a time consistency issue. And the way to solve the time consistency issue is to delegate to a banking union. Okay. So that's our first rational for banking union. Later on, I will mention a second rational for banking union, but that's what's going on here. So any question on, on this? Okay, so if there is no more que no, no question on this, let me mention a few extensions. Um, and I will go relatively fast through that. Uh, the first extension has to do with leverage. So what I assume earlier is that there is no possible leverage because none of the income, none of the in oops, no, it's not going to work very well. None of the income um, is pledgeable. Okay. Now you can in, in, in use, you can create some pledgeable income, row zero, um, that you can promise a date one to the investors. And of course, then the financing needs are smaller. But let me emphasize one thing. I mean, you, you tend to have big doom loops when you have leverage. Um, but let me emphasize one thing is that the doom loops will be very bad if you are in a situation of joint default. So let me explain. When the country defaults, uh, the country can default on just its public debt. Or it can also default on prior debt, meaning that its courts don't enforce uh, the contract, the debt contract of the private actors, the banks in this particular instance. Um, and as you can see, in case of joint default, uh, the shocks for the banks will be very big because first they lose money on the public bonds, they old, which we had before, but furthermore, um, the row zero will become zero because, or will be very small because people anticipate that in case of default on public debt, there will be also a default on private debt. And that, of course, increases the difficulty of the banks and that makes the doom loop even worse. Okay. Um, so that's relatively uh, straightforward. Uh, something which is not very well developed in the paper, but is, is interesting, uh, I think, is what happens if you have limited money for bailouts. Remember, I make this assumption that uh, you always have enough money for, for bailouts, so you can always rescue your banks. But of course, if the banks are big and their shortfall is big, you may not be able to raise enough money at date one to bail out your banks. In that case, uh, the banks may not want necessarily to minimally diversify and for a reason which is interesting, which, which is a picking order. So imagine that the country at date one doesn't have enough money, cannot raise enough money to bail out all the banks. So it has to choose which banks to bail out. So obviously it's going to choose the banks which are better capitalized because the banks which are better capitalized at date one will, will have a lower rescue cost. Then um, they, uh, there's a trade-off between the put on taxpayer money. So to maximize the put on taxpayer money, you like to put all your money in domestic debt. But if you put all your money in domestic debt, you're not going to be bailed out necessarily by, by, the, by, the, um, um, by the government. And what you like is to have a little bit more of B0 star so as to jump ahead of the queue and be rescued before the other banks. And the ECM will necessarily be giving rise to some heterogeneity. Um, I'm sorry, there are also some typo 
they put some 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 form prime there that there will be a density over the b0 i mean this is prime with a b0 there will be a density of a portfolio choices so there you don't quite have strategy complementarities because you also have an, an element of competition among the banks they want to diversify as, as little as they can but at the same time they want to be rescued by the government and if they are a little bit richer in bad state of nature than the other banks then they will be rescued first okay third thing that i announce is uh, sovereign debt maturity and i told you that i was assuming asset liability management in this model uh, the government gets its money from taxpayer money at, at day two. So it's kind of natural to issue at day zero bonds which match you at day two. But that doesn't have to be the case. And actually, you have to check that actually optimal to do that. Um, so what we do in, uh, to compare is we imagine that you issue some B0 tilde, uh, one period sovereign bonds, and then you have to roll the, them over at date one. So you use short-term debt instead of long-term debt. Okay. But to make things compatible, I want to fix the financing needs at date zero. So there's some government expenditure at date zero. Now, before, okay, before we, we had, uh, we had B0, G0, which was B0 times P0 where P0 is expectation of P1, so that the integral of 1 minus F of B1 of S uh, given S. Now, at date 0, you want, if you use short-term debt, B0 tilde, you want to issue the same amount. Now, this short-term debt in this model will be completely safe because you are going to roll it over at date, at date 1. So, at date 1, you'll be issuing you'll be issuing a debt BZ1, which will be BZ1 one tilde, which depends on S, such that you reimburse your debt B0 tilde. But the price P1 tilde of this, of this debt will be 1 minus F of B1 tilde of S, so the probability that you reimburse at day 2. Okay? So that's... So let me summarize. I'm assuming that you borrow the same amount of money at date zero in terms of revenue from issuing. You borrow the same, you, you get the same amount of money at G0 at date zero. But instead of buying, borrowing long, you borrow short and you roll over at date one. Now, this short term debt is going to solve a prime, which is that you reduce risk taking by banks because if they hold your domestic short term debt, they will. Uh, it becomes safe, and it's, it's going to be insulated against fiscal developments. Um, and therefore, uh, you will have safer banks. However, there is less risk sharing by foreign investors. And that's where the ALM aspects come in, which is that at date one, when you roll over your debt, the investors, of course, they know the state of nature. And of course, if the state of nature is bad, it's going to be very expensive for you to roll over your debt. And that's going to increase the expected default cost because you'll have a very high debt and you are going to end up with a very large default cost. So we have some conditions. I mean, it's, the analysis, as you might imagine, is more complex, but you have some conditions under which um, basically the second effect dominates the first and actually, the welfare effect is higher under long-term sovereign bonds, uh, public, public bonds, um, than under short-term ones. So you actually want to have long-term maturity. Uh, there are very few studies in um, international finance which basically endogenize the maturity structure. And I can't see why, of course, because it's actually quite a difficult exercise. But in this particular model, which is simple enough, we were able to, to do it. Okay. No questions. Okay. Um, and last, before we conclude, um, foreign banks. No. So we do it in the end. We say we reestablish the symmetry between. I mean, we we had Greek banks, Greek banks, and Greek government, and we had a German government. Um, now we are going to add German banks. 
And they are modeled just like domestic banks uh, of in Greece, in a sense, they have some net worth at date zero, they have some investment opportunity at date one. They will be bailed out by the German government if needed. Uh, by the way, if you are interested, there is a paper by Eric Mangus in his thesis, um, which says it may not be the possible for the German government uh, to bail out the German banks because it doesn't have enough information on its balance sheet. And the German government actually may want to bail out Greece directly as opposed to bailing out the German banks. It's actually very interesting. This is not going, what's going to happen here because it has enough information to bail out the German banks. But there is an anxiety which is different uh, from the previous anxiety, um, which is that if Greece is if Greece is lenient in its regulation, then the German banks will be able to hold Greek have Greek exposures, and that's going to make them more risky. That's going to increase the bailouts by the German government, and that's an anxiety on the German government. And that's going to be another argument in favor of banking union, but now the banking union won't be demanded by the risky country, but will be demanded by, um, by the safe country. But it's another reason for why you may want to have banking union. Okay. Okay, so this is, uh, this is it. Um, okay, I see that, uh, is Alberto typing or? Okay, could it be the case that the prevalence of short-term debt plays a role of discipline mechanism? Um, yeah, I mean, you could, in this particular case, you could have, um, um, you know, you could have what the kind of thing that you have in Calumet, Scan or, or or Diamond and Rajan for banks. You could have it for the government. You could issue short-term debt as a disciplining device. Uh, now it doesn't arise here. Uh, it's not going to to happen. Actually, it's it's probably the reverse that could happen because. Um, that could increase the um, bailout um, by, by the, the inter international investors. But you are right, it will be, it will be interesting. You are right, Alberto, it will be interesting to study those things. Um, also, in general, we don't like it uh, too much when you issue short, short, I mean, this short term discipline, short term that discipline devising is an interesting argument, but it's also a dangerous thing because, of course, it may create runs on the country um, and that that may make things uh, things worse okay um, it doesn't arise here but I think it's uh, it's a little bit of a weakness of the model and we could add this to the model I mean it's there's nothing wrong in, in what we write but we don't have this, this effect in there okay I see some questions coming Okay, are foreign banks a way to improve risk taking um, in the domestic banking system in the presence of consolidated supervision? Well, if you have consolidated supervision, you don't really need the foreign banks. Um, it's, it's really when you have domestic regulation, which we have had until now, uh, that you, you might want to have foreign banks, foreign banks which are regulated abroad because there will be more attention which is paid. Um, but your question actually raises another issue, which, which I'm going to, to discuss in a minute, which is what are the incentives of the banking union? I mean, you know, in a sense, the way we are arguing is the banking union is going to, to do the right thing. It's going to prevent risk taking, but at some point you really have to ask yourself, is that, a, is that a good thing? So, um, are foreign banks a way to improve risk taking in Okay, no, I think that's, a, sorry, that's a previous question. Alberto is typing a question.
If you want to continue, I'm going to be typing it for a couple of minutes. <laughs> Alberto, don't type a paper. I won't have time to go through it before before you go for lunch. That, that's right. Um, okay, so let me just sum up uh, and discuss a little bit what could be done uh, later on. So just the insight. The first is the feedback loop actually in this model, and that comes back to the previous point actually stems from prudent matching of debt maturity um, with the country's fiscal capability. It's precisely because you are matching uh, maturity with uh, the date at which you can have resources, which is day two, that the debt is, the debt is risky and that's what creates a feedback loop. But it's still optimal under some condition. The feedback loop is stronger in case of joint default. I went very fast through that. Um, as long as a country has the capability to bail out banks, the latter's exposure to their domestic government debt are strategic complements. Okay? Renationalization occurs when the legacy debt increases or when prospects about the country's fiscal capability worsen. And then, if three things get very bad, actually, you don't get the strategy complementarity anymore. You can get some competition aspects, so the banks may engage in a rat race. So they might actually, they would like not to diversify, but they want to be a little bit more solid than, than their other banks, so as to be in the picking order uh, for bailouts. Okay. And even when it has the ability to carefully monitor its banks, the government may strategy to turn a blind, blind eye to their lack of country diversification. And basically, they count on, on international bailout, legacy debt forgiveness, to finance the rescue of their banking sector in case of difficulties. And that gives a second reason for renationalization. Um, if the government lacks commitment, uh, then it's going to benefit from relinquishing its regulatory power to the next supranational supervisor. So, that, as I said, there are two benefits from banking union. There's a benefit for Greece and there's a benefit for Germany. Now, it's just, uh, just a, a step toward understanding better this uh, doom loop, uh, which everybody says doom loop is bad. Now, I think I understand a little bit better why it's bad. Um, one of the things that, of course, is interesting for, for you is uh, that many of the bailouts nowadays are not fiscal bailouts, I mean, uh, quasi-fiscal, but uh, they involve unconventional monetary policies, to, to be polite. Um, but basically, uh, central banks are very involved for, in, in the bailouts, and there are good reasons for that. Um, they do bailouts in various ways by lowering interest rates. They, are, they do bailouts by taking on uh, toxic assets on, on the balance sheet and so on. So how does it fit with all of that? I mean, this is a model of fiscal bailouts. Strategic defaults, I don't think that that, that will change things very much, but you know, who knows? Um, but my conjecture is that it is basically the same as what we have here. But then my last point is really um, about the governance of the banking union. Um, so what we have assumed with Emmanuel is basically that the banking union is uh, doing the right thing, is forcing diversification. Um, but you might imagine other situation where the banking union becomes very risk averse. So, actually to risk averse and basically forces the bank of each country to take very, very low risk because the banking union might only partially internalize the welfare of the countries. That's not in the model. In this model, the banking union does, does very well. And then there are all kinds of issues of risk transfers, um, which we are wondering about today in Europe with uh, a resolution mechanism with uh, European level deposit insurance and so on and so forth. None of that in the, is in the model. I think we should do better at um, at solve, at uh, modeling all those things. And probably you will have ten uh, ten other questions. 
So let me stop here and see, um, see if there are more questions. So uh, Alberto, you were typing a question, but I'm, I'm afraid I don't see the question. So do you want to, oh, I was thinking, I, I have it now. I was thinking of frameworks such as the one from the Atkinson, more hazard due to asymmetric information and enforcement prime. Okay. Um, and you were thinking of that. Oh yeah. So when you were talking about uh, short term debt as as um, as as basically a disciplining device. Yeah, I mean here you have some more hazard in a sense, which is a domestic regulator is being too lenient, um, and you have more hazard on the side of banks, which makes their balance sheet opaque, but you may also have more hazard on the side of the regulator who basically counts on server on foreign bailouts. Um, and that that will be a thing. Um, you mentioned the possibility of um, uh, low output realization, which trigger repayment instead of resharing transfer. So that's a good idea as well. So what you could have in the model is that you could have of the consumer, it could be random, but with some decision at date zero or at date one by the country itself. Um, in those cases, you would like to even reduce a risk sharing across countries. So, so it's true that if, if you have no more hazard, basically you like to have some insurance against the risk of default, so you like to have some kind of risk sharing across countries. But if, like in a at Kesson Mall, in the Kesson Mall, you have more hazard uh, by the country. Um, so, for example, the country could affect the distribution of uh, endowment E. That would be the way to formalize it. Then you like to reduce. Um, you, rely, you like to reduce the um, the risk sh uh, sharing component. Um, and one thing you could do is to create a run on short-term debt, and if there are news that the government has done the wrong thing at date zero to create income at date two, then you will end up with um, with a run. But my own view on that is that the run will be very costly because that will that will give rise to other kinds of run, like in Calvo's model, Calvo 1988, for example. That will give rise to other kinds of run. So the even if it does hasn't done anything wrong the government may actually be uh, short of money. And um, I think it's better basically to address directly the prime and basically regulate the banks better and get rid of this doom loop. Uh, I think it would, be, it would be a better strategy than just having short term debt as a disciplining device. But I may be wrong. I mean, I may be wrong. Before um, mine, there was another question by the Central Bank of Venezuela. If you go Could up. we solve the more hazard problem by having an independent national supervisor rather instead of having an independent supranational supra one? Um, yeah, I mean, the question is what does it mean to be an independent national supervisor? I mean, I hope, and you know, the jury is still out, I hope the Frankfurt ECB independent of political pressure and you know they will be able when a Spanish bank or a Greek bank or whatever uh, is risky to basically reduce the size of balance sheet private dividends maybe shut shut down the bank as well it will be a very political prime and I, I hope it's going to be an basically independent enough so as to be able to intervene and again don't forget the jury is out because of the political thing in Europe. I mean, as you probably know, uh, Europe, the European construction is not very popular all over Europe. We are going to have very soon European elections, so we'll see what happens. But uh, populist parties may actually uh, be very powerful, and both on the left and the right side of the spectrum, they lobby against the euro, they lobby against uh, Europe in general, and it's a scapegoat. Um, and then when uh, 
Frankfurt, the ECB says, you know, this uh, French, Spanish, Italian, Greek, Portuguese, or whatever bank has to uh, behave differently. Um, I could imagine a backlash in those countries. I hope not, but and I hope I'm completely wrong, but that's that's a possibility. So, you know, to answer the question from the bank, Central Bank of Venezuela, what I have in mind, what you call an independent national supervisor, is very much like an independent supranational one. It's hard to know, you know, in a sense, a number of, of those uh, regulators actually were independent, so to speak. Uh, but to what extent are you independent? Because, you know, if you are a French regulator, you, you, you think about your careers in France. If you are a Spanish regulator, you think about your career in Spain. And if you are, and if you are independent, and even if you are honest, um, there's still the fact that you are French, you are Spanish, you are Greek, right? And that's, that's natural in a sense. The second thing is they are not completely independent. So take the Central Bank of Spain. So the Central Bank of Spain, actually, according to an IMF report, uh, year, two years ago, I think, uh, maybe a year ago, um, had a report which was very interesting on, on what happened in Spain. As you know, probably better than I do, uh, the Spanish central bank actually were well, not bad at all. Actually, they saw the real estate market prime base early on. They warned about the primes, but both the central government and the regional government wanted to encourage real estate investment and basically turn a blind eye on that, knowing that if there were primes, Europe will be or the central bank, the ECB, will be behind. Um, so, yes, yes, an independent central bank could, could help, um, an event regulator, but don't forget that we had independent central banks often, but much of the power is often shared with, the, um, uh, with ministries, and also the central bankers, they often have um, national domestic uh, carrier concerns. So that's that's really possibility. So Laura is asking a question. Uh, beyond the case of Europe, for which banking union seems quite natural, how can the results of your model in terms of rational of the banking union be extended to Latin American or Asian emerging market economies? Okay, that share a lot of features. Uh, I quote you on that. And I didn't say anything. That share a lot of features uh, with countries uh, such as Greece or, or Spain uh, in Europe. Thank you for not putting France in there. Um, so, um, that goes back to the question. It's, it's something on, on which I wrote a paper, uh, I just revised on uh, solidarity of countries. I mean, it's not the solidarity of countries, but it's solidarity. It's just a legacy to get left worker. So let me clarify that. The debt forgiveness in this model comes from the private investors in Germany, basically saying we are going to forgive our debt. The other possibility is that the German government says, you know, we are going to cover the Greek debt. Okay. And the German government has more incentive actually than the private investors uh, to, um, to actually uh, bail out the Greek government because there are externalities coming from the Eurozone. There is a European construction, which is very strong, fortunately, in Germany, and so on and so forth. There, there used to be financial integration. Now, there is, as I said, there is not financial integration anymore, but there used to be financial integration until uh, 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, so I wrote a paper on solidarity and where, which, you know, so if you want to read it, it's on my website, uh, and try to explain those bailouts and what they imply uh, for borrowing. Um, now, what is the, what are the implications for Latin American countries or maybe Asian? So may, maybe with Asia, that's a little bit simpler because now we don't have any banking union, but we have some, um, some kind of liquidity arrangements and we have some solidarity already in place. Um, so that might, I haven't thought very much about it, to be honest, but that might also have some uh, something to say about the thing. 
so it will be more like solidarity among governments. You could also have debt renegotiation, that's possible. For Latin America, of course, you know much better than I do. Uh, so I'm going to make a fool of myself. But um, it could be that Argentina uh, uh, has primes. Oops, what's going on? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't have the I don't have the image anymore. Um, can you? What? Do you, what's going? Do you, do, can you see me or not? Oh yeah, that's that's back. Okay, sorry. I had some problem with the computer. Um, so, um, so it might be the case that if Argentina has trouble, either. There is a bailout of Argentina, Argentina by foreign investors, uh, just like you had Mexico in 1995 by the US and US investors. Uh, uh, that's a possibility. Or it might be the case that Brazil and uh, Uruguay and Chile, or I don't know, uh, think that it could get bad in Argentina politically and they might want to bail out. Uh, the answer is I, I don't know honestly what might happen, but I, you know this issue of solidarity is very big. It's a little bit, as I said, outside my model year because the model year is is not solidarity of countries, but it's um, it's legacy debt forgiveness. But you know, to the extent that uh, uh, the investment is kind of local. Uh, it could be very much correlated with the solidarity of countries. I don't know. Or you could have the U.S. basically uh, bailing out uh, Latin American countries. That's also the possibility if those are the big uh, big banks in the U.S. who invest in Latin America. Now, I'm not sure I answer. I'm not sure I answer your question. <laughs> uh, you have to bail me out, okay? I realize I'm the last obstacle between between you and lunch, <laughs> uh, so don't hesitate to shut me down. It's uh, it's up to you, um, but I'm I'm happy to answer other questions if I can. Okay, thanks. Okay. If there are further okay, questions, well, you can also raise your hand and I'll uh, enable your microphone uh, so that you can... Yeah, well, I want to see faces. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank, thank you very, very much for your invitation. I mean, that... That was fun, except for I don't see you. I think it's actually pretty efficient way of doing things. And uh, that was really fun and, and good questions. I'm sorry I cannot answer all of them, <laughs> but those are good questions for sure. Okay. Well, uh, I would really like to thank you on behalf of SEMLA and uh, the central banks in Latin America and the Caribbean who participated in this, this webinar. Uh, we appreciate that you took the time uh, I put here the link to the paper in case uh, anyone wants to read it, uh, look at it more carefully. Uh, you have it here on the chat window. And let me just remind you that uh, next week we'll have Marcus Brunemeyer, who will talk about the I theory of uh, money and redistributive monetary policy. And you can find the full schedule of webinars at the, the webinar uh, web page where you will be able to also to uh, get the paper that we are going to be discussing. So thank you very much to all of you and especially thank you very much for, to our speaker, Jan Tirol. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. I see Laura is typing, but
Well, th thanks, Laura. And uh, have, a good, have a good series of seminars. I saw that was very impressive, the list of speakers you had. So good luck. Goodbye. Bueno, muchas, muchas gracias a todos. Eh, si tienen sugerencias para las eh, próximas semanas, hay un par de, eh, de espacios todavía en, en junio, eh, eh, en días del mundial, entonces no sé si es buena idea eh, agendar algo, porque son días en los que uno de los días juega México, el otro de los días juega eh, Uruguay y Argentina, eh, pero ahí tenemos un par de espacios y hay algún documento que quieran escuchar, eh, eh, envíenme su sugerencia y yo trataré de hacer el contacto con eh, el expositor. Muchas gracias a todos. Hasta la próxima semana.